Hello, welcome to Eyes on Eye Care 2022. We are so excited to have you here on the implementation track. So just as an overall kind of background, as you know, Eyes on 2022 is one of the largest virtual education events ever hosted in the eye care industry with over 9,500 registration from optometrists, ophthalmologists, and technicians. At this three-day event, we'll be delivering 11 hours of free COPE-approved CE, seven hours of CME, and 36 hours of additional courses from over 70 world-class speakers. At this event, you'll learn how to grow your practice and expand your clinical skills with cutting-edge clinical and practice management education. And additionally, you can check out 22 custom-designed exhibitor booths and explore the latest diagnostics, treatments, and career opportunities from the leading companies in our industry. So make sure to check out the Innovation Zone, an all new area where products, services, and ideas are highlighted as potential changing the future of eye care. Additionally, we have over $8,000 worth of prizes to be given out at this show. You can win prizes in three different ways. Check out all the vendor booths, discover hidden raffle tickets around the show. I found some, they're pretty cool. And then three, listen to live presentations like you're doing now for raffle codes announced by the moderator. Lastly, those wishing to claim CE or CME must complete the pretest before watching their first CE or CME session. Head to the Continuing Education Hub to take the test. The test isn't graded, which is nice. It's just used to measure learning. My name is Kate Ham. I'm an optometrist in the Wichita, Kansas area, and I'm super excited to be here moderating the implementation track. I am here with one of my good friends, Dr. Devin Kennedy, and I'm super excited to learn about trends in refractive surgery, preparing for 2022. Devin currently is practicing at Doherty Vision Laser Vision Center in the LA area. Devin, I'm so excited to learn from you, so go ahead and take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, and thank you again, Eyes on 2022, for having me today. I'm very excited to talk to everyone about trends in refractive surgery, preparing for 2022, and, and really beyond what does five, 10 years down the line look like in terms of refractive surgery. So the way that I broke up this presentation for everyone today um, is really we're going to do a big overview on everything and anything to do with refractive surgery. We're going to start with laser vision correction. That's going to include more of your anterior se segment or uh, more superficial treatments such as LASIK, SMILE, PRK. Uh, then we're going to move to implantable columnar lenses, ICLs. Sometimes they are also referred to as implantable contact lenses. And then finally, we're gonna jump into refractive lens exchange, premium cataract surgery, and what are the trends that we could be seeing moving forward into 2022. So let's go ahead and get started with laser vision correction. So again, laser vision correction, it encompasses quite a bit. So LASIK, SMILE, PRK, as many of you guys know, when you're in practice, a lot of your patients are gonna to come to you asking for some type of referral, or trying to get feedback saying, you know, do you think I'm a candidate for LASIK? And usually it's LASIK that comes out of their mouth. They're not really um, aware that there's other procedures that you can get as well, um, which, is, which is great. So laser vision correction, refractive surgery has really become synonymous with LASIK. Uh, I myself, again, I practice in a refractive surgery practice. I have seen consults come in from age 18 to 72 is still asking for a LASIK procedure. Of course, it's my job to educate and making sure they're getting that correct um, recommendation made. One thing that was very interesting, and you guys are probably aware of, is that COVID-19 actually changed um, the laser vision correction trends that were going on. So pre-pandemic to post-pandemic, it looks pretty different. Um, refractive surgery has proven to be the exception and that, you know, there was a downturn in a lot of travel. There was a downturn in a lot of um, purchasing power for a while. And COVID-19 actually almost kick-started or restarted laser vision correction. So the Refractive Surgery Council, um, they run reports year to year. And what this organization does is it's trying to empower consumers to make educated um, decisions around refractive surgery trends. So as you can see, here we come at the end of quarter two, 2020, there was a large plummet in laser vision correction. Um, for a majority of us, we were all shut down at early 2020 for anywhere from four to six weeks. In that four to six week period, all elective surgery was postponed just because the hospitals were so impacted at that time. So we really saw that trend downwards 
And then when you look at the Refractive Surgery Council report, they actually report a consistent and strong laser vision correction procedure volume since the fourth quarter of 2020. And you can see that here as it tends to spike up. And that acceleration has only continued to grow within 2021. So at the beginning of 2021, it showed great promise and it has actually continued and we're reaching our highest levels in laser volume uh, since the uh, RSC has started reporting that tracking in 2015. In my practice, I could back that up. I have seen that this happen in 2020. Again, after everything opened back up, um, our referrals and individuals interested in any type of laser vision correction went through the roof and we're still seeing that trend. We're beating our numbers from last year, um, even through 2021. So we really don't show any signs of slowing down moving into 2022. And this trend was actually a big surprise for a lot of refractive surgery practice, for a lot of refractive surgeons, and that LASIK PRK smile started jumping back up once everything opened up. And it was kind of five main reasons that were teased out and why we were seeing patient interest in getting laser vision correction. The first one being those repeat warnings, avoid touching your face, making sure you're watching hands. And patients became very aware that they were touching their face constantly and applying contacts became one of those big worries. So a lot of our contact lens wearers actually decided to stop wearing contacts just because we didn't know a lot about the virus at that time and moved to glasses wear. I would say even when I'm doing pre-op exams, I generally ask my patients, are you primarily a contact lens wear or a glasses wear? And for a large majority of patients, they've been telling me, well, before the pandemic, I wore contacts all the time and now I've shifted to glasses. So the past year, I've really been a glasses wear. So that trend has still continued um, that people are not wearing as many contacts maybe as they were pre-pandemic levels. Uh, finally, we've got number two, uh, glasses fogging while wearing a mask. This has caused a big issue. There was news reports on this, news articles coming out and how we can reduce that fogging of the lens. A lot more individuals have extra downtime for surgery recovery. Of course, with that shutdown, a lot of, um, of workers actually went to a remote setting rather than an office and it allowed for a lot more flexibility. So patients actually felt like they had time to recover. The great thing about LASIK, for instance, is that visual recovery is pretty quick. Usually within 24 hours, if you have to jump back on your computer to send out an email, you could. And then number four, there was an increase in disposable income. Traveling restrictions um, caused a lot more disposable income because in 2020, a lot of people weren't actually able to go out of the states as they had planned. And then fine, lastly, um, a lot of my younger patients are actually reporting this, uh, that they were spending more time on their digital devices, again, working remote, really, you're just looking at a screen all day, and they felt that their eyes were getting very strained, dry, specifically when wearing contacts at the end of the day, and they were looking for a way for their eyes to feel better. So what do we expect to see in 2022? Um, and as I mentioned, we really don't expect that trend for laser vision correction to start going down. There's no indicators at this time. My practice, as I mentioned, we're still seeing growth compared to 2020. So we expect it will continue uh, to grow year over year. In the US market, uh, when you're looking at refractive surgery devices, it's actually expected to grow 7%. Uh, this analysis was run from 2018 and projecting out to 2028. The one thing that I thought was very interesting when I was reading this marketing report um, is that there's actually quite a bit of microkeratome um, lasers that are still gonna be used. So I would have thought or would assume that it would be more all of laser assisted with wavefront guided and topography, um, but just be aware even as we move um, past 2022, 2025, 2030, you are still gonna be having MK LASIK. One of the biggest factors for the growth in these laser vision correction trends is, of course, the increased incidence of myopia. We're going to be talking about that just a little bit later. And then also astigmatism. It's actually expected to be the largest area to grow in the refractive surgery segment due to the increased incidence of astigmatism and the, the advancing technology that we have to better correct um, astigmatic patients. And then finally, we're kind of getting to the newest kid on the block, which is SMILE. So that was FDA approved in 2016. Um, and SMILE is actually projected to continue to gain market share in both the US and globally. So what that means for us as optometrists is that when you're co-managing, I would expect not only to have say, a LASIK or PRK patient, I would expect to see more and more SMILE patients coming through your office in 2022 and beyond. All right, so the next 
section that we are going to move to is going to be implantable columnar lenses. Um, and for me, I really enjoy uh, managing implantable columnar lenses, lens patients. And I feel like there's going to be growth in this area for two main reasons. The first, as you probably already guessed, is going to be that increased incidence of myopia. Um, I know there was uh, two different tracks yesterday talking about myopia management and control. So I know we're pretty familiar uh, with the myopia epidemic, but I want us to concentrate on a high myopia because typically, usually how ICLs are used today is for individuals who have had a higher myopic prescription, individuals who it might not be as safe to do a LASIK or a PRK because we're ablating too much tissue or there's a risk of ectasia and that's where the ICL really fits in. Reason number two, why I actually expect optometrists to start managing these a lot more is that there's new technology that there is coming out. And I feel like this lens will be used more often because of the technology innovation. So let's jump into the myopia trends moving forward. Again, we're all pretty familiar. We've known for a while that myopia is gonna continue to progress, but I really want us to concentrate on the high, the high my myopic patients. So by 2050, we expect that half the world's population is projected to be myopic. Of that population, 1 billion people are expected to have high myopia. Um, in the studies and the reviews that I was looking over, high myopia was defined as greater than five diopters of nearsighted correction. Then by 2050, 58% of the U.S. population is expected to be myopic. So that's even more than half of the U.S. population. So again, there's going to be a big growth in that myopic correction. For global projections for high myopes, it's estimated that 10% of the population will be highly nearsighted. And then finally, when you look at the comparison from 2000 to the projected numbers for 2050, high myopes have gone up by seven and a half times, which is a huge number to keep in mind. Uh, these implications go beyond just refractive surgery. High myopes, we're gonna be managing for pathological myopia increased risk of, risk of glaucoma, increased risk of lattice, tears, detachments. So there's a lot of medical implications in addition to potentially using refractive uh, procedures to help these patients. And then when I was going through this lecture, there was two questions that weren't quite answered um, in these past studies and projections. The first is, how is my, myopia control going to change these trends? Um, if we are educating the public and they're more aware, Will myopia maybe not be half, will we be less than that? So that's a question we just don't know. And then number two, of course, we couldn't exactly prepare for this one, but COVID-19, how has it changed the progression of myopia in children? And how is that going to change the projection of these mild, moderate, and high myopes? There was a really interesting study that came out earlier this year in January. Um, it came out of China and it was looking at just that. Was there an increased incident in myopic shifts due to COVID-19 and the shutdowns? So for this study, what they did, it was a longitudinal study. It was started in 2015. Over 100,000 children were followed between 2015 and 2020. During the beginning of the school year in 2020, schools were actually closed from January to May due to COVID-19. And of course, if the schools were closed, students were moved to home-based learning. So a lot more screen time, a lot less time outdoors. The way that they gathered the data, um, they used photo screenings and then refractive surgery screenings, and they ran an analysis on that. And as ultimately what was found is that home confinement during COVID-19 was associated with a substantial myopic shift for younger school-aged children ages six to eight. And so that approximate shift was about 0.3 diopters. Um, the study did go to point out there is some limitation in the data that can actually be used from the study. Uh, for instance, preschoolers were not included. This went from age six to 13. Um, there was no cycloplegic refractions that were actually used and analyzed. And then there was a lack in biometry. Uh, there was no data on axial length and then corneal curvature. So there is some data missing, but overall that general trend was saying, yes, you know, we might be seeing this myopic shift. So I'm interested to know uh, more of these papers that come out in the coming years, whether it's a US population, European population, and then looking at how that compares against the study that took place in China. So when you look at the trends, I really want us to concentrate on ages six through eight. That is really where they saw that big shift. So when you look at the um, prevalence of myopia from 2015 to 2019, it stayed relatively st stable. It was less than 10% of children. When you get to 2020, you see a huge jump. We're going to over 20% um, of individuals that had myopia. 
specifically mild myopia, and now we're even seeing moderate myopia. When you look at the seven-year-olds, again, you're seeing a pretty equal jump here, but now we're getting more moderate myopia, which carries over to the eight-year-olds. Of course, ages nine through 13, they were pretty consistent trends. But what this has to do really with the corrective and refractive surgery is now are we almost expediting these moderate myopes and these high myopes because we're already seeing these large changes in ages six through eight. And when you kind of take a step back and look back at those global projections, we already know myopia is projected to double. So specifically here on figure number three, um, this was through the Holden study. I would like us to look at the age groups from age 20 to 40. You are seeing a near doubling of myopia in that age group. These are the individuals who are going to be in your office asking, hey, doc, I really don't like my glasses. I don't like my contacts. Is there anything that we can do about this to improve my vision? I want to be glasses free. And so, again, are we going to see an accelerated amount of growth in maybe 10, 15, 20 years from now from these children that had to do home-based learning? So that's something we just don't know yet. Um, and then again, I kind of want to focus really on those high myopia trends. So if we look at figure two um, from, again, this was a study out of Fulton Eye Institute. When you look at 2020 compared to 2050, there is a doubling of highly myopic patients globally, which is a huge amount. Again, we have those medical implications and then we also have patients who are gonna be looking for refractive surgery correction. And just as a reminder, a high myopia was defined as minus five diopters or greater for those individuals. So where does that leave us as PCP or as primary care optometrists? What options are available for our highly myopic adults who are interested in refractive surgery? As I mentioned, a lot of times these patients don't have that many options because we're ablating too much corneal tissue. When I start seeing these minus eight nines up to minus 16, we're gonna recommend that this patient move into an ICL lens for that vision correction. I wanted to quickly and briefly kind of touch on um, what an ICL is, if you're just not as familiar with this type of refractive surgery correction. So ICL technology in the US, currently there is only one lens that is approved through the FDA. Um, it's a posterior chamber phacic intraocular lens that's produced by Star Surgical. Um, I am not a paid consultant by Star Surgical, but I thought it was important to kind of walk through sequentially what goes on with ICL surgery. The current approval ratings for myopia is anywhere from minus three to minus 15 diopters. And torque correction was also approved, uh, which goes from minus one to minus four diopters. Uh, currently individuals age 21 through 45 can get this procedure. And then ICL is actually a two-step procedure. So the first step that's typically done is creating a fluid channel at the superior iris. Uh, there needs to be created a peripheral iridotomy, typically done one to two weeks prior to surgery using a YAG laser. However, if you do a YAG laser or PI on younger individuals, there's actually a lot of pain that can be affiliated with it. Uh, there can be pain, irritation, they can uh, develop a mild iritis afterwards. And that can add to a lot of anxiety that these patients have when they say, oh my gosh, that was just the laser, the fluid channel that you created for me. What is it gonna be like when I actually get the lens implanted? So there's also kind of this anxiety factor that happens with your patients as well. Uh, when we look at actually implanting the lens, so this lens of course goes behind the iris, it's in front of a natural lens and is placed in the sulcus of the eye. And then typically that YAG PI or a surgical PI can be done is gonna be superior at that iris because we're trying to reduce the amount of glare by using that upper lid to block uh, the peripheral iridotomy. So what is this update that I'm so excited about? Um, coming up hopefully in this next year, uh, the EVO, which is the next generation in ICL, will be approved through the FDA. Uh, I was hoping it was going to be by the end of 2021, but we're not quite there yet. So hopefully early 2022 or mid-2022, this lens will actually be out on the market. And why it is so novel is because it now has a central port. So you can see right here. So in the other ICLs, we do have these ports out in the periphery of the lens, but the central port allows for sufficient aqueous flow from the posterior to anterior chamber, which is allowing and maintaining the physiological structure of the anterior segment. Um, and so what that really means is that there is no need to create a peripheral iridotomy or iridectomy prior or concurrent with surgery. So really now this patient has to just come in, get this lens implanted, 
and it allows that central pore is going to allow for the aqueous to kind of bathe the natural lens. It's going to help reduce any type of cataract formation. And I would also imagine it's going to aid in post-op care and that we're not going to see as many pressure spikes because again, we have this central port. When we're talking about cataract formation, I know this is a very different possible complication from surgery compared to a LASIK smile or PRK. The incidence is actually pretty low. Um, in myopic ICLs, it's really around 6%, and only 1.2% of those actually become visually significant. When you're discussing this with patients, something to keep in mind is also the age range of your patients. So with the studies that came out, when you look at the incidence of an actual anterior cortical cataract developing, individuals who are getting this lens implanted closer into their 40s, remember from age 21 to 45, this lens can be implanted, Individuals who are maybe in their early 40s are at slightly higher risk of developing an anterior cortical cataract versus somebody who's in their 20s, mid 20s, or 30s. So again, for our younger patients, it's a great option if you've got a minus 12, a minus 10, minus 15 coming into your office saying, doc, I just am not getting great vision. It is not comfortable. Is there anything that we can do? So again, I'm really excited about the Evo, and I hope that we're going to get approval coming up here. Looking beyond 2022 for ICL technology, um, what I am really excited as well, this is happening over in Europe, is that they're looking at an extended depth of focus ICL to help address presbyopia. As we know, there's some limitation in what we can offer our presbyopic patients. Really our options are either LASIK with a monovision setup, or we can potentially do a refractive lens exchange. Um, but there's some risk with refractive lens exchange, right? So if you have a 43 year old who is looking for answers to their presbyopia and their nearsightedness, and we wanna do a refractive lens exchange, well, do we really wanna take any, all that accommodative effect that they still have? Granted, they're gonna lose it over time, but a 42 or 43 year old, that's pretty young to do an RLE. Another thing to keep in mind with RLE is that there um, is a slightly higher risk of retinal attachment or to tear during surgery as well. So really we have to weigh those risks and benefits when we're counseling our patients. Um, but really, I just wanted to quickly go on to this clinical trial. This was published out in 2020 and it took place over in Spain and Belgium. So 35 participants were in this study. The average age was 49 years old, and we really wanted to look at the performance and safety of this extended depth IOL. And I pulled out two of the kind of the, the top stats that came out of this. So 91% of participants achieved a binocular uncorrected visual acuity of 20, 32, or better at all testing distances, so distance intermediate and near. And then 97% of participants achieved 20, 25 or better uncorrected binocular near visual acuity. So there's still a little bit of room for improvement, especially when we're talking about all distances, um, but a majority of these patients were very satisfied with the extended depth of focus ICL. And it is currently actually commercially available over in Europe. There are only three countries that are offering it. Um, so again, one of those questions is where does an extended depth ICL fit into that refractive surgery discussion with your presbyopes? Um, again, advantages and disadvantages that we have to take into account. And of course, I don't really expect to see this lens over in the States for some time because we still have to go through FDA trials and approval over here. All right, so the last area that I'm gonna have us touch on is refractive lens exchange and premium cataract surgery. So what do we expect to see moving forward in the next year, five years, 10 years? So in terms of those trends to watch, um, there's kind of three areas that I'm going to have us touch on. One is the increased implantation of premium IOLs. When you look at the global revenue in 2019, premium IOLs accounted for a third of global revenue, and that's expected to grow up to 45% um, by 2026. So that premium IOL revenue is projected to account, again, for 45% of all revenue generated by surgery, which is a large market share. In terms of the US and what to expect in our patient populations, it's projected that premium IOL implantation, so if you're sending your patient out, about 16% of your patients, you should expect to have some type of premium IOL technology implanted during our cataract surgery. And then again, by 2026, that's expected to grow up to 21%. So these lenses are gonna become more common in your practice when you're co-managing these patients. 
So it might be a good idea just to keep up to date. I know tomorrow those two tracks talking about cataract surgery and pre and IOLs, uh, which I think will do a fantastic job going to what that looks like uh, for 2022 and the future beyond. I'm also gonna have us talk about increased utilization of femtosecond laser. So this is also called laser assisted cataract surgery. A lot of patients coming in for cataract evaluations are actually asking me about it even before I start the conversation. They're very interested in laser assisted cataract surgery versus a traditional technique. Uh, so we're gonna go over some key points in a meta-analysis that was done um, so that if your patients come to you, you kind of know the stats and data behind that. How is it different from a traditional uh, cataract surgery? And then finally, I'm gonna have us go into immediate bilateral cataract surgery. Um, so this is having cataract surgery on the same day. Standard of care in the US typically is we do one eye at a time, usually the worst the non-dominant eye, followed by the second eye one to three weeks later. And that paradigm could potentially be changing. We already have early US adopters. There's a large medical insurers and financial institution, or I should say medical institutions that are already doing this. Kaiser Permanente and the Veteran Affairs Medical Centers have started to shift to bilateral same day cataract surgery. And in some countries in Europe, um, this is actually what a majority of their patients do. In Finland in particular, about 40 to 60% of cataract patients actually get bilateral same day cataract surgery. In Spain and certain regions up to 80%. And then in, in Ontario, up in Canada, our Canadian friends up north, um, they also have a tendency to do immediate bilateral cataract surgery. So the first area that I'm gonna have a talk about is again, that laser assisted cataract surgery. A lot of my patients who've been coming in lately have been asking me right off the bat, doc, what are your thoughts on laser assisted versus the traditional method? So what I wanted to do is kind of give a general overview in, you know, is laser assisted better, worse or the same as a traditional or manual technique? Typically, if I'm making a strong recommendation on a laser-assisted cataract surgery, it's going to be for anyone who I know um, has compromised endothelial cells of the cornea. So think about your Fuchs patients where I know, man, if there's a lot of energy going into the eye, that swelling, it's going to be pretty persistent. Um, and then number two, individuals who have very, very dense cataracts. Think about your 2080, 2200 hand motion patients. We already know that a ton of energy is going to have to go into the eye to break up that cataract and remove it. Um, so we do know that laser assisted is going to allow us to put less energy into the eye, which should have less swelling down the line. And then when you look at the studies, so this was a study and review um, over these meta-analysis that were pulled. Um, the study came out in Australia 2021, so a little bit earlier this year. They broke it down into four main categories, comparing laser-assisted versus traditional. Um, so starting at corneal recovery, it's still a little mixed to conclusively say if laser-assisted is better over tr a traditional technique, but the meta-analysis did suggest that less ultrasound energy is used and that will lead to less corneal tissue damage. So again, your Fuchs patients, this could be advantageous for them or somebody who's already had a DSEC or a DMEC and we know they have a compromised cornea. Then um, in the study, it also showed that laser assist is actually safer in shallower anterior chamber patients, less than two millimeters. So typically those are gonna be your hyperopic patients. In terms of visual recovery, this is probably the biggest question that I get. Is this gonna help my vision come back faster? Um, and what it showed is that in the first six months, laser assisted cataract surgery is actually superior to a traditional technique. However, once you hit that six month range, whether you had laser assisted or a traditional, it about evens out. There was no big difference in the visual outcomes. So for short-term visual recovery, yes, um, pentosecond laser, it can help with that. But long-term six months or longer, vision's gonna be about the same regardless of what technique was used. One interesting one um, that I was reading over was anterior comp uh, capsular complications. Sometimes you can get a, a tear to occur. Um, in this study, it found that there was actually an increased incidence of anterior capsular tears uh, with laser assisted, but those visual outcomes were not any worse for it. There was also some limitation in that application and um, that the author suggested that this could be related to the laser setting itself and the unit used and could not be generalized to all um, different lasers that are used for cataract surgery. 
And then finally, this is really the biggest one and kind of the selling point for me in laser vicious traditional technique is posterior capsular complications. Um, so there was found to be a significant difference in laser assisted versus traditional, and that laser assisted had significant improvement in reducing the incidence of posterior capsular rupture. And that's a pretty big deal. So say for instance, we get that lens in the bag, but we ended up having a rupture regardless, that lens is gonna fall back into the eye. We're gonna have to send that patient over to retina to get a vitrectomy, get that lens removed, and then we're gonna have to probably put an anterior chamber IOL. That is a big process for your patient to go through. Uh, so again, through the analysis and studies, they found that laser assisted was anywhere from zero to 0.6% um, in, in terms of incidence compared to a traditional or manual technique, which was greater than 1%. So again, hopefully that'll help clarify and give you some background information when your patient asks you, which do you feel um, they should go for, assisted with laser or traditional? All right, so that last trend that I'm gonna have us touch on, um, and really I see this more taking place probably in the next five, 10, 15 years, as we continue to evolve, is gonna be immediate bilateral cataract surgery. Uh, so as with anything changing in medicine, there are always risks and there are always benefits. And the biggest benefit to immediate bilateral cataract surgery is actually cost savings and cost effectiveness. There was a study run uh, looking at the 2012 Medicare reimbursements, and what it found is that there was an estimated five, $500 million that could have been saved if more of those patients had been immediate bilateral cataract surgery um, versus, having, versus having surgery done one eye at a time. And as we, as we already know, healthcare expenditure is all, already a, a big issue um, here that we have to keep in mind with our patients. Other advantages include alleviating blockage from deferral cataract surgeries during the COVID-19 shutdown. Um, I can actually speak to this anecdotally. We had a lot of Kaiser and veteran patients who actually came to our practice who wanted to pay cash instead of going through their medical insurer because they didn't want to wait the six or nine months. Typically, when a patient is ready to get cataract surgery, they've gone through the evaluation and you tell them, yeah, these cataracts are reducing your vision. We can help improve this. They want to get that cataract surgery pretty soon. They don't want to be waiting an additional three, four, nine months out. Um, so again, this can help alleviate that blockage. There's also going to be increased efficiency in your exam flow. There tends to be fewer clinical visits. That post-operative care is simplified and streamlined because, again, both eyes are done on the same day. Another large advantage for quite a few of our patients is that there's only one application of general anesthesia. No, but not a lot of people are running to sign up to get surgery on their eyes. There is a lot of nervous patients out there. And there's also a lot of patients where they may be wheelchair bound. It may be difficult to actually get them to a surgical center or ambulatory center. Um, so one application of general anesthesia would greatly benefit these patients versus having to go through the whole process again. And then finally, just taking into mind our patient comfort, there would be a reduced amount of anosomitropia between getting the first eye done and the second eye. So think about your high myopes and your high hyperopes. I just had a plus six hyperope who had surgery on one eye. She had to wait uh, two weeks to get the other eye done. And she was having a tough time with this big difference. So it just helps with the general comfort of our patients as well. Now I'm gonna kind of flip to the other side of the coin. What are the risks of bilateral surgery? Probably the biggest one that is jumping out to you is endophthalmitis. There is the potential for bilateral post-surgical complications, endophthalmitis being the biggest one because it can result in functional blindness. Surgical complications can also arise during surgery, which would lead to the surgeon performing cataract surgery one eye at a time. So again, say for instance, you had a capsular rupture, we now have to pause the surgery, this patient needs to go over to retina, and then once that eye is cleared, we would move to eye number two. There's the potential for prolonged recovery due to cystoid macular edema, prolonged corneal swelling that I mentioned earlier, or anterior chamber reactions. Uh, so usually if your patient has one eye blurry and they can still see out of the other eye, they're gonna be okay, they're gonna be patient with you. I don't know how happy our patients would be if theoretically, or say they happen to get swelling in both eyes for whatever reason, they are not gonna be the happiest person when you're checking them and going, well, we're still waiting for the swelling to be down, please be patient. And then finally, and this is probably the number two reason uh, why there's concern between surgeons and co-managing doctors, 
is that there is a decreased ability to tailor an IOL choice or the IOL power, power for the second eye. So typically for cataract surgery, you see the patient one day and one week after surgery. At that one week mark, you're doing a manifest refraction. And that manifest refraction is actually used to make sure that we can make the second eye more on target. Do we need to adjust that IOL for any reason? And by doing it bilaterally, we are kind of missing out on that step. So I did want to address those two biggest concerns. As I mentioned, endophthalmitis is the biggest emergency that optometrists or co-managing docs are looking out for. If you see this, this has to go directly to retina because it has huge implications and could potentially lead to blindness. Fortunately, in all the studies that were done, there were only four cases of bilateral endophthalmitis uh, resulting from same-day cataract surgery to ever be published, um, all of which breached protocol. So by protocol, what that means is if you are going to do a bilateral cataract surgery, you need to make sure that your stellar technique is used on eye number one. All those tools and equipment need to be removed, and then a new sterile field, all new equipment needs to be used for eye number two. So again, in those four cases, that protocol was breached uh, where the sterile field uh, was compromised. And then in a review, a case analysis review, over 95,000 cases of same day bilateral cataract procedures were evaluated for the incidence of endophthalmitis. It was one in around 6,000, and that was further reduced with the use of interocular antibiotics to one in 14,000, which is pretty close to what we would expect uh, for someone who had a delayed sequential bilateral cataracts or, uh, cataract surgery. So again, could it theoretically happen? Absolutely it could, um, but fortunately only four cases have been reported. All right, and so the last concern for when we're doing a bilateral cataract surgery is again, we're missing out on that one week post-op so that we can better target the other eye. Again, it's the number cause two for concern um, just because we're missing that window. And from two, two studies that came out, that's really only partially true. Um, we can actually mitigate that risk of being off on IOL calculations if we're using the most modern and up-to-date diagnostic tools. Uh, so for instance, using an IOL Master 700 LinStar with the most up-to-date generation of IOL formulas, making sure we're appropriately diagnosing and looking out for early tear film abnormalities and making sure that's treated prior to doing any of that diagnostic testing. And then making sure that the intraoperative systems that are being used are the most up to date. Um, if that is all done, uh, what these two studies found is that it's actually very similar um, in the refractive errors that you will obtain between delayed sequential bi bilateral cataract surgery versus same day cataract surgery. And keep in mind when I'm talking about doing immediate bilateral cataract surgery, these cases have to be really hand picked, these have to be good candidates. For instance, we would not be doing a patient same day bilateral cataract surgery if they had prior refractive surgery. So think about somebody who had surgery 20 years ago, RK, um, you could have PRK, LASIK, um, because we already know there is a slightly higher chance of miscalculation from having that corneal tissue altered. So those would not be good candidates for that. We would still be doing a delayed uh, sequential bilateral cataract surgery because we truly do need that input um, from the one week post-operative um, prescription to be able to better target the second eye. One other thing that actually came up uh, closer to September and August of this year is that insurance carriers are actually starting to change their policies. Um, in terms of insurance authorization, Aetna was under a lot of uh, heat and under some hot water when they announced that they were going to go ahead and change their authorization to needing a prior auth for any cataract surgery. And it actually, uh, the American Academy of Ophthalmology came out saying that they disagreed with that and that cataract surgery, it is essential. Even though cataract surgery is always considered elective, for some patients, it's really not elective. Uh, for instance, I just had a patient who was in his mid fifties. He was hand motion in both eyes. He was an iron worker. He was completely dependent on his wife because um, the posterior capsule had opacified so fast that he had to stop working. And again, he was depending on his wife. He was functionally blind. He was not able to work. And so having to go through this prior authorization process delayed his surgery a little bit longer. 
Uh, fortunately, he's allowed to get surgery and I'm excited to see where the vision is going to be after, but this is happening more and more often. And this isn't just for cataract surgery as a whole. It's happening across the board. It's medications, MRIs, you name it. I'm expecting to see more prior authorizations and more medical insurances come out and saying, well, really, we need that prior off before we can move forward. Uh, so again, it's just something to keep in mind. And when you're educating your patients, let them know that just because you're getting that consult, it's probably going to take a little bit of time for them to actually get surgery. All right. The last thing that I'm quickly going to touch on, again, I'm not going to go too much into this just because I know there are some great lectures coming up tomorrow in regards to premium IOLs uh, for RLE and cataract surgery is the latest lens updates. Um, so really in the past year in 2020 of these lenses that came out, um, Vivi from Alcon and then the light adjustable lens from RX Sight. Um, there are two lenses that have been getting a lot of buzz and are pretty exciting. At my practice, we have been using the Vivity lens and we get a lot of good feedback from our patients. So just so you're kind of aware and have a baseline for the Vivity, what it is, is it's an extended depth of focus. It's novel in the fact that there is, it's non-diffracting. So it's supposed to reduce the amount of glare and halo. So when you think about multifocal lenses, um, they tend to get a lot of glare and halo, nighttime glare is one of those side effects. This extended depth of focus is supposed to reduce that. It's, and the claim and the deliverable here is that it's supposed to provide monofocal quality vision distance for both intermediate and distant. So typically we'll tell our patients, you'll get good driving distance. And then that dashboard or your computer, you'll be able to pr read pretty well, but you'll still need reading glasses. And we have patients who have absolutely loved this lens. So it's been exciting to be able to use this lens. Um, and I'm excited to see how patients keep responding to it. The light adjustable lens also came out and it was very novel in the fact that after you implant this lens, um, there's a light delivery system that causes uh, the macromers to go under uh, a polymerization to change the prescription. So what that means is that this patient, say they want to be either myopic and they wanna be bilateral undercorrected. They wanna keep a functional nearsightedness. So say we implant both of these light adjustable lenses that patient can come back to you and say, actually, I think maybe I wanna try monovision or actually I wanna change from being slightly nearsighted and I want to push that prescription out. So with this lens, we actually have the ability to do that. Um, of course, the patient has to protect themselves from UV when they walk outside because that's how we're locking in the prescription. So you do have to wear a pair of glasses until the treatment is fully set. Um, but what's really amazing is that there's a wide rate of treatment that you can do in one session. You can kind of see it down here from that sphere. You can correct anywhere from minus two diopters to plus two diopters of hyperopia. And then that still correction can go from minus a half to minus two. All right. And I know we are wrapping up our session here. Um, so again, there's a lot of non-FDA approval IOLs that are planning to come out. We're still looking for that holy grail we're looking for a true accommodating IOL. We're not quite there yet. Um, there's different lenses that are currently trying to get approval for FDA. Clinical trials are currently over in Europe. So that's things like fluid-filled lenses that actually have an accommodative amplitude. Or in this case, again, it's not, a, it's not an accommodating IOL, but what it is, it has a, a base and lens component where you can implant that base and then stay down the line. There's new technology come out. Well, theoretically, you could go into the eye take out the optics and put in a new lens. So again, just different ways um, that we're trying to find, again, that holy grail that we're looking for in an accommodating IOL to give our patients their vision back. All right. And then I did want to take a pause and thank everybody for attending the session and for joining us for Eyes on 2022. I have absolutely loved uh, talking to you guys this morning. And if you have any questions, I am happy to answer them. Evan, this is incredible. I learned so much today. Um, as we've all known that you are, you just are like doing such great things in the laser vision correction world. But uh, there was a question that popped up in the comments and somebody was curious about with smile, um, would that be ex acceptable, something to investigate for somebody that's over a minus 10? What, what are your thoughts there? 
So there's still going to be limitation. Again, the biggest thing that we have to keep in mind is those corneal maps. So the biggest problem with a minus 10 specifically for smile or LASIK that we're thinking about is that we're ablating that tissue. So whether it's LASIK or smile, we still have to ablate that tissue. It's anywhere from 15 to 17 microns. That's a big chunk that we're taking out. Um, smile, there could potentially be some advantages and that when we are doing that correction, it's actually a little bit deeper in the stroma so that we are keeping the integrity of the front surface of the cornea. But again, I would be very hard pressed to recommend LASIK or PRK um, for a minus 10 myope because I know the risk of ectasia could um, cause issues down the line essentially. So really I would probably be pushing that patient to an ICL. That's awesome, really great information. So as ODs, as we kind of, you were saying, like there's patients with a wide variety of prescriptions and especially our high myopes, like we talked about. And with those ICLs, how can we as optometrists best guide our patients to be able to guide them to with expectations and giving them education around treatments um, to really prepare them before they go to their surgeon to have this, you know, to have that first conversation? Absolutely. My best recommendation would be to have an open line of communication with your surgeons, whoever you are referring to. Um, a lot of surgeons are very open for you to come and actually watch the procedure, learn the verbiage that they actually talk to their patients about so that you guys are on the same page. So if you're making a recommendation, a surgeon goes, yeah, I totally agree with that. I think an ICL could be a great option for this patient. And on the refract consult side, because again, I'm at a refractive surgery center, it really helps when ODs talk to patients about their different options saying, you know, you could be a candidate for LASIK, and ICL might also be an option because a lot of patients aren't aware that ICL is out there. Um, like I said, I, expect, I would project that ICL is going to become more commonplace 10, 15 years down the line. But a lot of patients come in and they've never heard of ICL and they go, oh, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, the one other advantage for ICL um, in particular is that it's actually placed at the nodal point. So a lot of those high myopes that are having difficulty getting down to the 2020 line, 2025 line, they're actually getting better vision because again, we're placing the ICL at the nodal point versus what a contact or glasses can correct. Uh, but again, my biggest advice would be having that open line of communication, actually going in, watching surgeries, listen to the education that's given to the patient uh, by your particular surgeon. That's so smart, you know, especially since you're referring that patient there, you want to make sure Absolutely. That, that, you know, that you're feeling like, you know, the doctor well, the doctor knows you well, so that patient feels like there's a seamless transitions between the two. Um, and I think it's so smart uh, watching the procedures. I loved that as a part of optometry school and as a part of just like kind of gaining my education. It's just fascinating to see uh, procedures done um, and just better understand and describe what's going on to my patients. That's so smart. So Absolutely. I, the biggest is that you're able to, to walk through that uh, the procedure with them. Yeah, because when you can decrease that fears, you know, like we talked, like you said, a lot of people get uncomfortable when you talk about like eye stuff Absolutely. and eye surgeries. <laughs> when you can have that moment where you're like, it's not a big deal. Like I've seen it. I can explain it to you. It just really prepares them to have really great outcomes. Absolutely. So another question, a lot of people get concerned about referring to for laser vision correction or any sort of vision correction because they think, man, I'm going to lose a patient. I'm not going to have this patient that's going to come back to my office for glasses, for contacts. And so how do I keep them coming back? But in a lot of ways, it could actually be a practice builder. It can be something that is a really great thing for your practice to grow. So any optometrist or anybody that's concerned about referring their patients out, how would you squash those concerns? Absolutely. So especially, so at my practice, really working with optometrists is the cornerstone of what we do. A lot of our referrals come from ODs. One way that we mitigate that fear is that we do not have an optical. We are not prescribing glasses. We are there to help our patients um, in terms of they're looking for surgery and we want to provide that for them. And then of course, after surgery, we refer all those patients back for post-operative care. So when you, you know, you have this relationship with these patients, you are their trusted go-to. So when you say, hey, Mr. Smith, I'm gonna refer you to go ahead and get cataract surgery. They're gonna pick your brain about what lens you recommend. Do you, do you think that laser cystic cataract surgery is worth it? It coming from uh, your, you as an optom their optometrist carries a lot of weight. And then when the surgeon says, yes, I agree with this, but you know what? We actually co-manage with your original optometrist. Again, that trust is just there. 
So really working with a surgeon, making sure that you're doing the post-ops with your patients and guiding your patients through that trust goes a long way. Um, and then of course, there's little things that you can do for us. Again, we always refer back, even for LASIK patients, I always tell them, even though we give you this perfect 2020 vision, you still were a minus six myope. You need dilated eye exams. Mm -hmm. And that will be through your ECP or your primary eye care provider. I absolutely have to respect that relationship you have with them. I'm going to send you back uh, to Dr. Um, Joe or whoever, whoever it is. So <laughs> no, I think that's such a, a poignant point that it were that really at the end of the day, it's all coming back to the optometrist and that annual eye exam and all of that care. Absolutely. Devin, I learned a ton from you today. This is incredible information and tons of new things coming up. So I just wanted to thank you for all of your time today um, and everybody that watched and enjoyed this session for, with us. We have another session coming up at 11 o'clock where we're gonna be learning more about multifocal IOLs, um, well, monofocal, so sorry, newest innovations in monofocal um, in IOLs and different things of that nature. So stick around, we'll see you all at 11 o'clock. Thank you so much, Devin, for all your time today. Absolutely, thank you for having me.